Okay, so I just, yeah, okay, so click it again. Perfect, there you go. You're welcome, okay, bye. <laughs> hey, Snow. <laughs> Hi, Jules. Hi, Mary. Okay, perfect. All right, so Mary, Marin wants me to log into um, Zoom to see if anyone's going to go there and redirect them here. Um, I hope I can open both at the same time. Can you see me? Yeah, we can see you. It's funny, I can't see me. That's weird. Uh, Mary, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear? You can hear me. Yes. Yes. If you check your browser, uh, the one that open with Google Meet should have a red uh, dot. Mm -hmm. It's probably that you are not seeing the window with the Google Meet window. Hmm. How do I fix that? Soon? So. You, you, well, Mary, you're going to be a small box in a corner. Okay, all right. right. I don't yeah. mind being a small box in a corner. Yeah. That's good. Right. I can see everyone big, but I'm small in my corner. Okay, good. Right. Hi, Momo. I, I can't hear you, Momo. <laughs> Sorry, I mute myself. <laughs> how, how is it possible not to hear Momo? That, that has never ever happened in the past. Before. Yeah, I'm on mute. Yeah. So okay. he knows I heard your question. So if you click the um the gas like the gallery view, you can change the the way you, you see people. Thank you. So it, the gallery view. Okay. Yeah. That's that's true. So. Yeah. And there uh, is like presenting view once like someone shared a screen or ultimately when you just highlight that person. So Mary, yeah. So what do I need to do? If you click on the box that you're showing, it's going to blow you up. Like the little box, just click on it and you'll you'll come to the okay. floor. I don't need to be that blown up. Okay, I see how to do it though, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Uh, Momo, I do need to tell you that I, I invited a friend of mine to, and I did not know that he would send the link to a friend of his who is a leader in the Taiwanese community in New York. I've forgotten exactly who she is, but I will make him introduce you to him as a penalty because I didn't realize that he was going to ex extend the invitation, but I can only believe that's a good thing, right? Wow. Absolutely. I'm looking for it. Wow, look at all these faces. Oh my I know. God. Alex has a big smile on her face. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Joe. Hello, everyone. It's a taco. It's collage oh your faces. <laughs> it's a taco, long time no see. Five minutes ago. Yeah. <laughs> and how do I see who else is on here? Um, how do you how do you advance the screen using this? How do you move to see what other thumbnails are there besides the eight, nine of us? So yeah, there's the three little dots in the oh. corner. If you click on that, it's going to pop up um, a widget that says change layout. And mm -hmm. then you click on change layout and you can select whatever you want. Okay, more tiles. Exactly. Okay, thanks. And then you can go back to full screen when you click on your tile. Thank you. And mm -hmm. on the top, it shows that currently we have 13 participants. There's an icon with two people and uh, 13, oh. the number on the corner. OK. Hi, Damon. So may I ask who is now recording this meeting? Is this good show? evening. What? Damon was saying good evening. I was just saying good evening. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Momo, Momo, whoever let us in is recording. So. Oh, interesting. That's great. Okay. Hi, Ping. Well, people are joining. Hi, Mary.
Momo, would you like to help uh, interview Audrey? Yep. I mean, you are the moderator. I was just. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'll just call you out for a special mention. Yeah, but I have to thank you because of this. I have a, like a time to talk with her, like like a couple of times in between, like oh. or chat. I'm yeah. so glad. Well, you know, she's she's a, really busy all the time. All the time. So. I just got an excuse. <laughs> because of you. Thank you so much. And like a month ago, he she sorry she just took a like a, a tech talk. Um, interview. So, any of you who are interested, she explained it explicitly on that TED talk about all the like the, the, the digital transformation that he made. Uh, she made during this period of time. So, highly recommend it. Just on TED talk and Do you know, Audrey time, TED talk. Uh, I'm St from Audrey's office. Uh, Audrey will be here in a couple of minutes. Just okay. let you know. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, um, she's shouting. She's the one helping us to scale Joe all this stuff. Yeah. yeah. Nice to meet you guys. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Audrey, uh, Momo, maybe you put the link in um, the chat for Audrey's TED Talk. Can you do that? Oh, yeah. I can give you the link. Sure. Hi, Joanna. Hi, Risha. Sorry to suggest you shouldn't be on the call before. I was trying to save your time. In retrospect, I missed you there. <laughs> we'll, t we'll talk. Maybe as soon as you have a chance, send me some good times and we'll, we'll talk. Lots of exciting stuff. Momo, uh, Audrey was okay with the format, so we'll, we'll go with the format that we have, yeah? Right. Great. <laughs> Alexandra, we should try for a Zoom sometime. Yes. <laughs> there, I couldn't figure out where the unmute button was. <laughs> That's pretty scary. For me, that would be not a no, I'm scary. used to using Zoom at work, so this was uh, throwing me off, but I found it. <laughs> So now we have 22 people, four, eight, 12, 16. So those of you who are more familiar with this format, how do you find out where the other um, thumbnails are hiding? Do you press to the right or below or what do you do? Snow, do you know how to? Do you see on your right up corner, there are two people icon? with the number 24. If you click mm -hmm. on that, then it will provide a list to the right side. Oh, thank you. But it will, will it allow me to see their photographs? Oh, I just have to click on and see them, huh? <clears throat> okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And if you're currently in the layout of the side, uh, sidebar, the rest of people are little thumbnails to the right. Okay. <clears throat> There's Audrey. Looks like we may be ready to go. Yeah. Audrey, I, I, I'm I, pretty sure you remember me from the Innovation and Change class, but I'm the one who started off with You're My Hero. So I am so delighted that you could join us tonight. Really so excited. And, and what perfect timing. I'm re reading a book by Francis Moore Lapp on um, democracy. And I think that now with the assault on transparency that we're seeing from the United States government where we can't even get access to our COVID information without having it 
whitewashed by the White House? Could we have started our conversations of consequence with a more important speaker? Thank you so much. So for those of you who don't know Audrey, I'm going to let her introduce herself because she can do that very well. Momo has put into the chat space a link to her most recent TED talk. The format tonight will be a 40 minute moderated conversation between Mary and Audrey that will amend that to be mostly Audrey talking because we have so much to learn from her. I will actually flow the questions and we'll have 20 minutes at the end and Chinos will keep us honest about that because I'm not very honest about that. So we have 20 minutes for Q and A at the end. And Audrey, would you like to start or may I start with this question? Uh, with, this is our sample introduction. Audrey, we asked you to initiate this talk because in the next 40 quarters, we want to move the world toward a more positive future. Uh, excuse me, Audrey has some technical problems, so she will link, uh, relink uh, later. Uh, in okay. Seconds, so sorry. Yeah. Okay, that's okay. Maria Jose, nice to see mm -hmm. you. Rodrigo, nice to see you. I'm seeing everybody else. So I'm going to start again. We mm -hmm. asked Audrey to initiate this talk because we're on a mission, Mission 2030. We want those UN Sustainable Development Goals to get met. We have 40 quarters to move our world toward a more positive future. Audrey is definitely moving our world toward a more possible future. You're on a mission, Audrey. We're seeing that mission carried out in a country called Taiwan, and congratulations on the way you handled COVID over there and just about everything mm -hmm. else. Thank Our you. understanding is that your mission is about using radical transparency to make better decisions and shape better futures, and we would love you to speak to that. Awesome. Um, so is the sound getting through? It is. Okay, that's great. That's great. Yeah, I just rejoined with um, higher definition video, and hopefully uh, that this will work. So um, yeah, really happy to to be back uh, to to reengage in a conversation, and this time with a COVID uh, focus. Um, and so I'll just skip the the prelude, I guess, and and go straight into the the topic. Um, there's a saying that uh, anything that we're born with is human nature, and anything that that uh, is introduced after we're born is technology. Uh, and so for me, uh, personally, democracy is definitely technology uh, because I was born in the martial law. Uh, and I still remember how it was like uh, to have no freedom of press, of speech, of assembly, uh, and so on. Uh, and so uh, we only had our first presidential election when I was 15 years old, 1996. And that's uh, after the World Web came about. And so for us, democracy, internet, not two things, right? It's the same generation, the, the same kind of people working on it. And so that's why our democratic um, in, uh, intuitions uh, is always that of the focus on finding common ground in internet culture that's called rough consensus um, and creating common understanding, not division. And so um, I think Taiwan really benefits uh, from those early internet communities in the 80s and 90s, in particular the bulletin board system culture, which is still very much active in Taiwan um, and maintained by the social sector. <coughs> by National Taiwan University, for example, uh, is our largest Reddit-like forum, the PTT. Uh, they do not serve advertisers' um, benefits. They do not serve um, shareholders' benefits. Rather, it's just a bunch of students having fun uh, for a very long time, for, for, for 30 years. Um, and so um, we really benefit from that because it's one of the three pillars uh, of the social innovation system that uh, we uh, collectively refer to as the Taiwan model. It's really easy to remember uh, the keywords are fast, fair, and fun. So uh, the fast, <laughs> the the fast part, which is uh, collective intelligence, uh, relied uh, on such kind of public forums. So the collective intelligence, for example, upvoted a certain uh, whistleblowing from Dr. Li Wenliang last December uh, that there are seven new SARS cases uh, in the Wuhan um, seafood market uh, in the Huanan seafood market, uh, and so. 
at exactly the same hour, uh, December 31 at 2 a.m., uh, where Dr. Li Wenliang was being questioned by his institution. He would later um, face punishments from his police uh, institutions. The same time, the PTT board has somebody with the nickname No More Pipe reposting Dr. Li Wenliang's whistleblowing. And our medical officers immediately noticed this upvote and issue an order that says all passengers flying in from Wuhan to Taiwan need to start health inspections the very next day, the first day of 2020. And so this says to me two things. First, that the civil society trust this public forum enough to talk about possible new SARS outbreaks in the public forum. Um, according to Civicus Monitor, Taiwan is the only uh, completely open society uh, in the whole of Asia. And if you count Asia Pacific, then we and New Zealand are the only two. Um, and so there's no fear of repercussions are being harmonized uh, by talking about um, the scientific validity of Dr. Li Wenliang's whistleblowing. And also the government trusts the citizens enough to take it seriously and treat it as if SARS has happened again, something we've always been preparing so, since Audrey, 2003. That's, you know, that's, that's the first of... segment. Yeah. <laughs> yes? Mary? No, from a very particular context of one. Yeah. Uh, Mary, you're breaking, you're breaking in and out. Can you hear me? Yeah. Chinos? Yes, we can hear you oh, now. Okay. You're good. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. So, you're good. So, okay. I, I don't want to interrupt you because I'm really. No, no please, because word. it's just I three just, pillars. I'm done with the first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I think. Fast is so important. You can see here in the United States, we've been very slow to go on this one. And part of it is because people do seem to fear, they fear punishment for speaking the truth. So just for everyone here, you know, we can talk about democracy, we can talk about transparency, we can talk about leading as if life matters, but they're really just kind of heady concepts until you actually see in action mm -hmm. how important it is to be fast and to trust that the people will give you the information that you need to make sound decisions. And that's what we're trying to do in our learning community too. So, so far, Audrey, FAST is working. How mm -hmm. about the FAIR part? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think, uh, so I would just add one more uh, point to the, to the FAST part, uh, because this is not just about uh, the citizens contributing intelligence for the government to work with, but also if the citizens see the government uh, have failings, like we have not thought of something, that uh, this is not working well, it, uh, the feedback also has to be really fast. Uh, so I, I'll use one concrete example. So um, our Central Epidemic Command Center, the CECC, uh, starting from January uh, for more than four months, uh, hosts a press conference live streamed uh, every day. And they answered all the questions from journalists, uh, which is also live streamed. Uh, and so uh, everybody with anything that they want to question uh, here, uh, they can call 1922, which is a landline, uh, and the immediate pickup rate of that line is more than 90%, so they can get all their uh, fears and doubts um, answered. Uh, but sometimes they point out genuine failings. For example, there was one day in April uh, when a young boy called and said that he doesn't want to go to school because his schoolmates may laugh at him for wearing a pink medical mask. And that's because when you ration medical mask, you don't get to pick the color. And so it just so happens that all he gets is pink medical mask. And so the very next day, everybody in the CECC press conference, you're looking at our health minister uh, and all the experts, all the medical officers started wearing pink um, medical masks. Uh, and uh, the, the commander Chen Shizhong even said that his uh, childhood role model was the pink panther. Uh, anyway, so <laughs> the idea is that making sure everybody learns about gender mainstreaming and suddenly the boy is now the most hip boy because only he wears the mask that the heroes wear. Uh, and so this kind of fast response also builds trust between the government and the civil society. So it's, it's not about trust as an abstract concept, but rather trustworthiness through this kind of radical accountability. Um, so is it kind of uh, in the style of Taiwanese reversal in Taiwan ministers trust you? Uh, and that's always uh, where the um, minister Chen Shizhong has been responding uh, to those uh, innovations coming in from the civil society. And so this 24 hour, like my idea, just become public policy also helps very much in uh, earning trustworthiness and which is also part of uh, why fairness um, is ensured by people looking at it in a kind of participatory accountability. And, and now I, I have to introduce this G0V, uh, which is uh, one of the movement uh, that I'm heavily involved in. So G0V, uh, as we talked a little bit last conversation, is a simple idea 
for each government website and services that the uh, citizen doesn't like. Instead of protesting, they would just uh, take a, for example, website join.gov.tw, which is our participation platform, 10 million or more users. Um, we will just change the O to a zero. Uh, and build join the G0V.TW, which is a reimagined uh, kind of shadow government that does the same thing um, as the original government website, uh, but better, or at least uh, could be better. Uh, and so it's always open source and relinquishing the copyright. And this is very important because then this is a uh, paves the way of what we call reverse procurement. When we ramped up the facial mask production, making sure that everybody can use their national health insurance card to collect masks from nearby pharmacies, fairness was the guiding principle. But at the very beginning, nobody knew which pharmacies near them still have uh, masks in stock. Uh, and so someone with the name uh, Wu Jiangwei, Howard Wu, uh, in from Tainan, just built this map out of nowhere uh, and shows the red, which is the places with lo uh, low stock of uh, masks, green, which is a place with the high uh, stock, uh, yellow, something in between. And it shows uh, children's masks and adults' masks. Uh, and so uh, it originally relied on uh, people to report uh, the queuing the masks uh, level uh, voluntarily. Uh, of course, as with any crowdsourced uh, project, this went viral, um, have a high R value. Uh, so people shared this tool, and uh, which cost Howard Wu to owe Google like 20, 20K US dollars uh, in the first few hours um, in the API usage fees. Uh, and of course, he had to take it down. Uh, and then uh, he went on the GovZero Slack channel uh, asking, you know, um, I I'm driven bankrupt by this uh, public interest tool that I just developed, uh, what to do. Uh, and so quite a few engineers just hopped down and provided uh, assistance. And, and I'm uh, one of the engineers on the GovZero Collective. Uh, and I just showed Howard Wu's map uh, to our premier, uh, Premier Su Jun Chang, saying that we really need to support this um, social innovation. Uh, and then uh, because this uh, guides people better than anything that we can do through the uh, live stream press conferences or 1922. And the premier saw the value and immediately said, OK, our national health insurance agency uh, need to publish uh, in real time uh, open API, not just open data published every day or every week, but open API published every 30 seconds that will uh, make uh, that people uh, with um, the health coverage, which is more than 99.99% of citizen residents who show any symptom will then feel comfortable uh, in finding the nearby pharmacy with mask, take a medical mask, go to a local clinic, knowing for sure that they will get treated fairly and without incurring any financial or social burden. Uh, and so this was wildly successful and immediately there's people with blindness saying that we can't use them up. Uh, so, but because this open API, there's uh, in the first week more than 100 different tools, uh, not just maps, but also voice assistants, um, chatbots, uh, and things like that, making sure that anyone can feel inclusive uh, in ensuring their fairness. And uh, I, I really have to emphasize on participatory accountability, because if you go to this pharmacy, which has uh, 58 adult masks in store at a time. Uh, and if you're an adult, uh, and then you swipe your NHI card, you expect in a couple of minutes on your favorite tool uh, that sees this deplete to 49 because uh, the rationing quota is nine uh, per two weeks for adults. If you are a child, you expect this number to deplete by 10 uh, in a couple of minutes on your favorite uh, visualization tool. So everybody, instead of blindly trusting the government or the National Health Insurance Agency, trust the people queuing before and after them uh, to check the numbers and ensure that the system is actually working as intended. This is the same principle as distributed ledgers. Uh, this is a kind of distributed ledger. Uh, and so um, this also, uh, like any distributed ledger, uh, have people started uh, analyzing it, writing dashboards um, and visualizing uh, the trends of supply and demand so that uh, we can correct our uh, supply and demand uh, curve uh, by introducing uh, better, more fair uh, distribution policies, which we uh, um, change every week um, based on those uh, people's analysis. And they analyze it so that uh, in particular municipality like Xinju uh, or the Taipei cities where the um, science parks are, people really work very long hours. So after they went off work, all the pharmacies is closed already. So there's systemically around 20% of people who cannot easily get access uh, by this methodology. And so we had to work with convenience stores uh, so that you can collect the, through pre-ordering your um, allotments uh, 24 hours a day. Uh, and so you see 
uh, Su Chang Chang, uh, our premier, smiling happily because that's the day we started working uh, with the convenience stores uh, one month into the rationing uh, in March. Um, and so, and that is ensures fairness of all kinds, right? Of people who work long hours, short hours. So at the end, there's more than 90% of people who have um, access this rationing of masks um, very easily throughout uh, the, the uh, epidemic. And because um, some like 9% or less, uh, they don't want to collect. We, we even ask what, what they're thinking. And so many of them said, uh, we have plenty of those uh, at our house already. <laughs> so they didn't need the rationing, uh, and, but they demanded, uh, since we asked nicely, they demanded that we make a feature in the app of pre-ordering masks that they can dedicate their uncollected quota uh, to international humanitarian aid to the doctors and nurses around the world, uh, including in US and Canada. Um, and so we're like, yeah, why not? Uh, and so we implemented that. Uh, and then the mass dedication dashboard, which is um, a public ledger too for everybody to check. Uh, at this right this moment, um, there's more than uh, 700,000 dedicators uh, who dedicate a uh, total of um, more than 5 million medical masks. So it's not just our foreign service donating masks to international uh, community. You can actually see the names, including my name, uh, on, the, on the dashboard uh, that uh, contributes to the international uh, community. And so altogether, uh, everybody feel that there's a fairness of uh, initially between people uh, of different proximity to pharmacies and then people with different times to queue and then people with different work schedules and then uh, between different parts of the world and so this extends fairness uh, toward uh, all kinds a kind of intersectional fairness principle so so audrey is actually moving into another question which is we talk a lot about this internet of things but how do we create an internet of beings and i think the examples that she's given us are just so precise because we're using technology in the service of life and in the service of the real needs of real people across a diverse spectrum of need and so congratulations on also being able to export it to those lesser developed countries like the United States. We really appreciate all the help we can get right now. So thank you for that. Uh, I mean, I guess we're doing a couple of things right, but when I listen to you talking about with the history of Taiwan, it wasn't always so easy to do that. These are, these are huge breakthroughs in terms of transparency, internet of being, and using technology not as a toy, but actually as a tool to assist. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. thank you. And we haven't even gotten to the fun yet, Audrey. That's What's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I, I think you made a really, really good point in that it's not always easy for the public sector, for the administration uh, to um, kind of see technologies this way, which is why civic technologists is, is so important because the legitimacy is already established, right? Uh, and Google even agreed to waive the API usage fees after they see that this is a a perfect moment for corporate social responsibility uh, and business development, I guess. Uh, and so when the social sector and the economic sector already um, work on something with the social sector firmly in the lead, it's much easier for the government to just say, okay, we'll just you know provide whatever data you need uh, and deliver that as an open innovation. Uh, because if the government's idea, then of course we have to convince the people. But if there's uh, already a well accepted idea by the people, then all we have to do is to ensure the systems uh, sustainability. Uh, and so this is what I call reverse procurement, uh, which is more fast uh, and also more fun. Right. So let, let's move on to the fun part. Um, yeah. So, so uh, it, it's not just a pandemic, right? Uh, every other um, place in the world, as well as Taiwan, is dealing with both the pandemic and the infodemic. Uh, that is to say, conspiracy theories. And people do feel anxious. Uh, it is a stressful time. A lot of panic buying, conspiracy theories, things like that. Uh, but fortunately, even before the pandemic, we already are um, like, um, Head deep, neck deep, uh, head deep at one point uh, with uh, infodemic. And so we have a really good counter disinformation strategy and system already. Uh, and it's also very easy to remember. Um, it's called uh, humor over rumor. Um, and so uh, the, the intuition, very simply, is that most conspiracy theories travel on outrage. 
outrage being a potent um, effect, a potent emotion, um, have a high R value on social media, maybe three. Like uh, on each outrage um, message, people on average will share to three people um, within uh, the first hour. Um, and so the idea uh, when there's a, a trending disinformation like this, uh, for example, and I quote, um, there was a saying that said, um, because we're ramping up mass facial mass production is the same material as tissue papers. So we're going to run out of tissue papers very soon, unquote. Um, and so people just, just rushed out to buy tissue papers uh, and causing a lot of panic. And, and that may actually cause more, more damage than the pandemic itself uh, in, in Taiwan, at least. Um, and so uh, we really have to counter it. And our uh, principle, the triple two principle, uh, says that within the first two hours, we have to roll out two pictures, um, each less than 200 uh, characters long. Uh, that um, is funny. It's more funny than the outrage. Uh, that is to say, having a higher R value so that people will laugh at it and share it to more people, vaccinating the population. And so the same premiere you just saw smiling uh, here uh, in a convenience store, um, within, uh, I think, the first hour uh, after the panic buying, wrote out this uh, gem of an internet meme. Um, and this is uh, him showing his backside, wiggling his bottom a little bit, uh, and says in very large font, each of us only have one pair of Botox. Uh, and it's a wordplay because in Mandarin, uh, Botox twin uh, sounds the same as stockpiling twin. Um, and so um, there's no point in stockpiling uh, because you can't use that much anyway. Uh, and then a table, a very serious table saying um, that uh, the tissue paper material came from South America and it's paper. Um, and the PP material that makes medical masks is domestic. So no matter what we produce, it will not interfere with uh, tissue paper. So this, this is genius. And, and this has a very high R value. <laughs> and, and then people just share it. It is a very trendy internet meme uh, at that point. Uh, and so um, it, it went absolutely viral. So within a couple of days, the panic buying of tissue papers just died down. Uh, and then <laughs> finally, we, we found out the person who spread the rumor in the first place was a tissue paper reseller. <laughs> Go figure. So, <laughs> uh, and, and so this is not a single shot, right? The premier did that all the time. Like uh, after a while, uh, there was a panic buying of instant noodles. Uh, and then he showed a equally funny meme um, and showing a large uh, um, amount of uh, um, the the t uh, instant noodles in stock uh, and says that there's a lot, please buy as much as you want. Uh, and then uh, the various uh, county uh, mayors and so on just replied from our agricultural uh, parts, uh, the more rural parts in Taiwan, just replied saying, but uh, eating instant noodles alone is not healthy. You have to uh, add some vegetables to it. And they post a lot of vegetable pictures. But in any case, it just become like a, uh, like a very funny thing that you can join uh, and uh, um, scientifically speaking, it's impossible uh, to feel at once on the same topic, both outrage and joy. It's just not possible. Uh, so uh, if you have watched the movie Inside Out, you, you know what I'm talking about. So uh, if we um, uh, color the, the, the topic um, fun already, uh, then people who have love about it is literally unable to feel outrage and, and they can't really share uh, the, the conspiracy theories anymore. And so that's why uh, in each of our ministry, there's a team of people, sometimes professional comedians, uh, that engages the public, uh, just like uh, there was traditional uh, media officers that talks to journalists, uh, parliamentary officers that talks to uh, the MPs. Uh, we have participation officers that talks to hashtags. Um, and hashtags are, are harder to talk to, right? Because there's no one single person representing a hashtag. Uh, but uh, you can engage the hashtag. Uh, and so our participation officer from the Ministry of Health and Welfare um, have this brilliant idea of after each CCC press conference that introduced a scientific measure, um, they just went back home, take a photo of the dog that lives with the officer. Uh, and the spokes dog of the CCC says, if you're outdoor, you have to keep two Shiba Inu away from uh, each other. If you're <laughs> indoor, you have to keep three dogs away from each other. Very easy to remember. Uh, and uh, cover your mouth and nose when sneezing. Don't do what the dog does. Um, and uh, this is very important. Wear a mask to protect you from your own dirty and washed hands. Um, and, and remember to pre-order those masks as well. Uh, and so this is uh, uh, 
incentive design, right? If you build Musk as something that uh, you protect others, it has a lower R value. This idea is less worth spreading for many individuals. But if you say, wear a mask to re remind yourself that don't touch your own mouth with your unwashed hands, this is very intuitive and has a very high R value. It's easier to spread. And that's how we make sure that Taiwanese people feel calm and collected, even during the pandemic. And we never suffered uh, a lockdown or a takedown um, of the pandemic. And so this is the third pillar, fun. And a lot of more fun memes, including one recorded by our then vice president, also textbook author of epidemiology can be found at TaiwanCanHelp.us. Audrey, you know, it, you, you've, you've done quite a lot of work and thinking, obviously. I'm, I'm really taken aback by the insight that outrage and joy cannot exist at the same time. I mean, it sounds very intuitive, but I'm wondering how how your team came up with this idea that outrage actually doesn't enable us as much as real engagement. How did how did that idea start to percolate in your team, and 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 who said, oh, that's crazy, or oh, gee, that's mm. really insightful? How did you test it? Because you know you're you're kind of giving us the back end of the story. It looks perfect, but where mm. did it begin? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, in the beginning, we occupied the parliament, but uh, that, that's too far away, right? That's in 2014. Um, <laughs> and, but, 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 but that's actually uh, the, the case, because at the time, um, the MPs were refusing to deliberate substantially the CSSTA, the Cross-Trade Service and uh, Trade Agreement. And that is why it's so important for the people uh, to take the parliament uh, and basically um, do the MPs work uh, directly uh, because they were on strike, so to speak. Uh, and so, um, yeah, thanks, uh, ST, for sharing the uh, slides that I just shared. So um, the CSSTA um, protest is uh, interesting in the sense that um, even with half a million people on the street and many more online, there's uh, no violence around the occupied parliament uh, after the first couple of days and nobody went missing or dead because we live stream everything. Uh, we make sure that all the NGOs, all the 20 different aspects, uh, one of them talking about whether we need to um, really allow PRC components in our then new 4G network, uh, which is a debate that people are having right now, but we had that uh, six years earlier. Uh, and then the people on the street actually came to consider Census, thanks to the deliberation uh, technologies and facilitators uh, and uh, convinced, for example, our National Communication Commission at that time, there, there really is no private sector company period uh, in the PRC. Um, everything is state owned, actually. It's just a matter of whether they want to change the leadership or not of uh, large companies. Uh, and so the, the point here is that if people on the street have a, a first-hand experience of how it's like to come to rough consensus, come on understanding shared values among different positions, then they would not settle for less. So at the end of that year, all the mayors that supported open government gets elected sometime without preparing an oration speech. Um, and all the mayors that did not did not get elected. So open government is the, one of the rare things that uh, all the four major parties in our parliament agrees on. They just signed the open parliament um, agreement and, uh, yesterday. So uh, in my team uh, then uh, is uh, around 20 people as uh, permanent staff, uh, 30 or so people every year as interns. Uh, but the 20 people is um, uh, half of them are secondments from different ministries. Half of them are experts uh, from the civil societies, um, most of them um, social innovators and occupiers. Um, and so it's a very strange office with, with very different um, idea scape, biodiversity, because my HR policy is that if you want to join, of course, if you're a career public service, then you have to convince your minister. Uh, but otherwise, uh, the volunteers have to A, add a new perspective, like coming from a different background compared to every other um, staff, and be uh, willing to give as much, uh, at least as much as they take. So people who are secondments in my office still work for their ministries agenda. Uh, the ministry still pay them salary. I don't give, give them orders, nor do I take orders, of course. Uh, all I ask is that they work out loud. That is to say, willing to share the best practice or better practices uh, with every other secondment, and that applies equally. And so uh, we run this um, PDIS, the public digital innovation space, um, as a very much a adhocracy. People just think of a great idea, manage to convince one or two fellow uh, secondments uh, or experts, and they just 
go and make it happen. Um, and all we do is to have lunch um, every week and enjoy some uh, recreational activities uh, like ordering lunch boxes together and so on uh, in our virtual workspaces. And it's very much like an internal startup. And that's how we brainstorm all those ideas. And my role is mostly just to order pizza, clean up the room, fix uh, <laughs> server errors, uh, or uh, just you know making sure that the space works uh, properly. And if it all goes wrong, if any good, uh, good idea eventually gets implemented, implemented very badly, uh, well, it's all my fault. Uh, that is literally my only role. I think you ought to write that up as the new definition of leadership, order pizza, clean up the room, and it'll be all your fault when it's over anyway. So just enjoy it and go. That's, that's the most brilliant piece of leadership information I've ever heard. Thank you very much. <laughs> So now to the tough question. As you know, in the world, transparency is not exactly trending. I mean, it may be trending with feet on the street, but it's not exactly trending across the governments of the world. Is it any thoughts about that? Any ideas about how all of us might mm -hmm. enable our governments to be fast, fair, and more oh. fun? Right. Um, you know, to, to paraphrase the saying, like, don't hate the media, be the media. Um, I guess the GovZero saying could be, you know, don't hate the government, be the government. Uh, and, so the, the, and, and literally, I mean, the, the call to action of the GovZero movement is to fork the government, very careful pronunciation, fork the government, right? So uh, forking uh, in computer science means that taking something, not destroying it, uh, but taking it to a different direction, showing different imagination. The mask map uh, was built upon the previous contributions of the air map, uh, which is uh, thousands of people, now tens of thousands now, uh, using very inexpensive, like less than 100 US dollars each um, micro sensors to measure the air quality, like to PM 2.5 uh, across Taiwan. So, and actually across the world, uh, because it's open innovation, right? Open hardware and software. And so this creates a, a huge kind of legitimacy crisis for our environmental minister at a time, because uh, they only has less than 100 weather stations, uh, but the people have uh, thousands or tens of thousands. So who are you going to trust as the primary school um, balcony uh, of probably your children's school, uh, just a few meters, a few couple um, kilometers at most from you, or is it a, a, a few hundred kilometers from you, this very precise weather station? Of course, you're going to trust your community. Uh, and so if those uh, numbers differ, it creates a lot of pressure on the environment minister. Uh, and so that is my, my recommendation. Just, you know, be the fast, fair, and fun governance system. There's a lot of technologies uh, that uh, the commons stack, uh, so to speak, uh, can help people to build such a data commons. And once um, people in primary schools learn data stewardship, that is about competency, producing data and media, rather than literacy, consuming data and media, then they are empowered to really negotiate with the government as the Taiwanese airbox communities did. They specifically said, there are some industrial areas that are gaps that we cannot break and enter and install our air boxes, but we suspect them for polluting the air. Um, and the industries in there says we, we do nothing of that sort. Uh, but who, whose uh, words is right? Nobody knows. Uh, and so the environment ministry eventually said, OK, OK, we will work with your micro uh, sensors. We will even calibrate uh, that so it works in higher humidity levels. And we agree to look at the industrial parks. And it turns out that we own the lamp the public sector on the lamp in the industrial parks. So we just installed their design, their micro weather stations on the uh, lamps that shows everybody that really the uh, industries are or are not contributing to air pollution. And so again, this is reverse procurement. It's the social sector <clears throat> building legitimacy without waiting for anyone, working on technologies that are enabling and are appropriate. Uh, and then uh, the economic sector feeling the pressure um, produces um, you know, less expensive uh, kits that, that can enable this kind of work. And then they together convince the public sector that you need to work with us uh, actually after us, uh, not just for us. So instead of uh, for the people, the government is constantly pressured by this outside game to work with the people and eventually after the people. Uh, but of course, in other parts around the world, it's a win already if you can get your municipality to work with the people uh, at the beginning. Yeah, I think it's more and more a challenge. You know, I'm a dedicated believer in all things American, except all the terrible things we do. And it is, you know, quite a moment to be in this country where 
people power doesn't seem to be having much of an impact. Young people are shot in the face, older people are beaten up just because they're using their first so-called First Amendment rights to actually attempt to make government more accountable and more transparent. This way, I'm so glad that you're speaking with us tonight. And I know you're speaking from afar, literally and figuratively. Do you see something happening worldwide that is a reason to believe that governments will begin to really respect the needs of their people? And you went mute, Audrey. That's not allowed. That was a really tough question. Yeah. There you <laughs> okay, yeah. So, yeah, I, I'm speaking from the future, quite literally. Mm -hmm. right? um, so, I, it's Wednesday here. So, anyway, so <laughs> the point <laughs> that I, I'm trying to make from the future uh, is that um, it's not about people um, convincing the government uh, to, to be more transparent, or I, I would argue more importantly, to be more accountable. Um, in uh, From the history, uh, we, we see that uh, no matter it's climate change, whether it's the infodemic, uh, whether it's the pandemic, and so on, um, it all relies on what I refer to as a kind of societal inoculation. Um, so Taiwan didn't perform that that well during SARS in 2003, um, and we had to lock down an entire hospital unannounced, uh, and people, you know, even jumped uh, out from that hospital. It was very traumatic for everyone who's above 30 years old. We decided that uh, 37 people dead directly because of SARS is 37 people too many. Uh, and, and that's why uh, our death um, toll is uh, throughout the SARS 2.0, which is COVID-19, uh, is um, always in the single digits. This is uh, psychologically important for us. Uh, and so um, I think because of that, then people generally agree that even if the government was pretty um, incompetent, at least uh, the municipal and the central government were saying very different things during SARS, that is not a um, cause for despair. That is not a cause for, for distress. Rather, <clears throat> people would <clears throat> build social sector organizations um, and uh, such as the large charities uh, that organized uh, right after the earthquake and right after each uh, major typhoon and so on to uh, take the matter to their own hands, so to speak. And, and this has paid real dividends. Uh, even now, if Taiwan has a really large flood, people are going to trust the uh, disaster numbers reported by the Ciji Foundation. Many people would do that um, more than our uh, Ministry of um, Transportation, which uh, is the head of the Weather Bureau. Momo is nodding, so I'm not making this up. So, <laughs> so, so those, those large not-for-profit um, charities really gained legitimacy throughout each and every crisis. And so they eventually, uh, and that's the outside game that I'm referring to, um, made sure that the government can take the organizational structure, such as the Central Epidemic Command and so from the social sector as the thing to do. Uh, and so without waiting for uh, the right leader or things like that, it creates a political atmosphere um, of uh, nonviolent um, communication that uh, just like occupying the parliament nonviolently uh, leaves the, the decision makers no other choice, but then uh, you know working with um, the occupiers. And that's how I was invited in as a reverse mentor anyway. And, and so I would say keep working on those hashtags, those are really important. That's the most important organizational technique, technology that we can work with now uh, and expand the hashtags so that it's fast, it's fair and it's fun. And eventually, um, you know, the, there's a crack in everything and that's, that's how the light gets in. That's where the light gets in. I love your Leonard Cohen. Thank you very much for that reminder. It's beautiful. Yeah, there, that's how the light gets in. Can I, uh, this question wasn't on the script, so please feel free to not answer it and then we'll turn it over to everybody else to ask questions. <clears throat> Taiwan is an island nation, yes, fair enough to say that, and you're very subject to climate crisis. How are these systems of more accountable and more transparent governance working to help Taiwan deal with not climate change, but climate crisis? 
Yeah, uh, here we, we call it the climate emergency, but I think it's exactly the same idea. So <laughs> I will not quibble on words, uh, like whether it's an emergency, a crisis, or, or uh, something even more a radical, a apocalypse, or, or, or things like that. But it's serious, that, that's the point. Um, and so um, I, I think uh, this can be answered in two different uh, prongs. Uh, one is about the Internet of Beings, which is part of my job description, actually. Uh, the Internet of Beings is is a, a simple idea, really. Uh, it's, um, as is most intuitive, it's just give uh, rivers, um, oceans, mountains, personhood, uh, as we did um, for corporates, like corporate legal nonfiction, uh, personhood. Uh, and, and this is actually already implemented uh, in uh, some indigenous uh, areas, and not just Taiwan, uh, New Zealand also uh, made the Wanarui River uh, a, a person uh, and so that they can have a seat at a table, a seat uh, at a board uh, and then make votes uh, and uh, sue for damage uh, if uh, the river suffers damage. Uh, and so this is uh, very important because otherwise the environment doesn't vote and the people who are at the business end of the climate crisis uh, is yet to be born and they don't have votes either. <laughs> and so it's important that the future generations and the environment in general have a way to kind of reflect um, the, the uh, feelings um, it's weird to use the word feelings, but if you have watched the movie Avatar, you know what I'm talking about. That the feelings um, into uh, the decision-making procedure by having, like in New Zealand, is one person from the uh, indigenous nation, uh, the Maori, uh, and, and one from the, the crown uh, to speak uh, like the speakers of the trees uh, and of the rivers. Uh, and so this kind of um, understanding can only be built with this collective sense-making community, like I just shared uh, with the airbox. The same bunch of people through presidential hackathon is now working on a water box also, which is putting a voice to, to rivers, right, through um, MBIOT uh, zero G technology that reports pollution levels continuously uh, and, and like that. And so this kind of environmental collective data coalitions and collaboratives um, can put a voice to the environment and eventually realize this uh, natural personhood. Uh, and it's also helped by our transitional justice uh, work with the indigenous nations because they see the highest mountain in Taiwan, Saviya, or the Jade Mountain, um, also Pantogunung. Um, I, I keep, you know, learning these different ind indigenous names. Um, they they um, see them as a person already, a, a spirit, a ancient spirit. And so we really need to uh, learn from the indigenous uh, people's culture in a transcultural way to incorporate <coughs> this holistic view uh, into our decision-making, our democracy, this procedure. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is more mundane, right? This is just about carbon pricing, <laughs> carbon trading, um, the green energy, uh, um, you know, uh, certificates uh, that can be uh, sold on a open market. Uh, the Taiwan Semiconductor Company, the TSMC, not, not only built one of the largest arrays of solar panels, but also uh, work directly uh, with the wind uh, power people uh, to procure uh, uh, green energy and so on. And so this is just market design. But market design is also important because the market is one of the easier way to spread ideas across. So if you price uh, carbons um, correctly, uh, so people would work on circular economy, um, uh, moving from a production model to a rental model much more easily if most of those environmental externalities are appropriately priced. And our very vibrant uh, fintech space uh, with DeFi, this, uh, decentralized finance, and so on are already doing so without waiting for the Taiwan Power Company or things like that. There's at least three different uh, distributor uh, teams that just pitched um, to me in the past month or so on um, building a carbon trade uh, market and visualization and the related uh, plannings uh, using Ethereum and other uh, ledger technologies uh, that would build uh, familiarity at least and hopefully legitimacy that would also pressure uh, the larger companies uh, to change. So that's a more mundane, more market driven way. Thank you, Audrey. I, I want to be sure that, you know, as per your mission and mine, we include voices. So at this point, I'd, I'd like to open it up to any questions or comments or any thoughts that you would like to share with Audrey. And we have one from Snow. Snow, you can you can speak. You're unmuted, right? So. Yes, um, I have a question that to what degree do you see the principle of uh, fast, fair and fun influence by the size of the government or enterprises? 
uh, sometimes big organizations are good, not good at listening is simply because the, the structure and hierarchical uh, setting. And are there any ways that we can address that or improve the data processing so that we can improve that experience? Yeah, this is a really good question. And thank you for typing it out. Um, and so on the chat room, I encourage people to do that. Um, and so um, um, in the very beginning, right, if you only have um, like, as I said, 20 people in a startup, as in the case of Pedis, um, it the hierarchy doesn't make sense, right? It's just, you know, people who have fun together, uh, literally, um, and uh, just share uh, music and laughter uh, and work with our interns, um, including Momo. Uh, and so, uh, right, uh, in, and even if we may be uh, quite distanced in different time zones, we just um, party uh, all the time. And so there, there's no need uh, to, to, to introduce hierarchy. But of course, uh, because numbers, numbers, and all, there, if there's more than 150 people, then you have to introduce some sort of weak links. And weak links uh, include, <clears throat> of course, commanding relationships, which makes it a hierarchy, uh, or hashtags, which is not hierarchy. Um, but of course, hashtags came later. Uh, so <laughs> most larger organizations uh, chose not hashtags, but rather taxonomy, like a tree structure. Um, in, in Japan, the, uh, um, the uh, large corporate Corporations are literally called a tree-like corporation, uh, brain with branches and and things like that, and it, precisely because of this. But uh, once it uh, grows to a certain size, uh, the hierarchies itself become unmanageable. Like because in our mind we can only hold like seven plus or minus two things. If you have more than nine levels of hierarchy, nobody can uh, hold that hierarchical uh, branch in mind. And so we would be at peak hierarchy at that time. So once you reach peak hierarchy, like peak oil, um, it, it suddenly uh, hashtags makes much more sense because the hierarchies uh, just keep adding uh, the management overhead without delivering any uh, motivation or, or efficiency because people can't keep the hierarchy in their head anyway. And, and then people will be attracted to hashtags. Um, and so I, I think that there's a dialectic here in a very small and in a very large horizontalism always makes more sense. But in the middle, um, sometimes hierarchy can seem more effective. And so we can do two things, right? We can uh, make sure that the grassroots level um, uh, are accountable to each other. They prove to the larger environment that they can very much well take care of their own purposes uh, without having to resort to hierarchies. This is what the open collective movements, the platform cooperative movement and so on are, are working to prove. And they have now um, successfully scaled to the thousands or tens of thousands level. And, and that's a really good thing. And then um, on the uh, worldwide, uh, like with pandemic, people in different time zones are uh, now discovering that we're on the same spaceship anyway, that we have to work with the same urgency anyway, uh, no matter if you're a island nation or a continental, um, like continental people may feel like climate change is not a crisis, it's two generations down the line, right? Uh, but um, with pan pandemic, it's everybody's just two months away from each other. So once you feel this uh, high solidarity, um, then you wouldn't uh, rely on traditional hierarchies. In the past months uh, or so, I, I saw a lot of different jurisdictions uh, um, high-level medical officers, uh, which previously would not uh, join video conference because they were, I guess, older and <clears throat> distrust video conference because they had bad experiences in their youth. Um, but now they're discovering that this is actually working really well. And uh, video conferences like this uh, Hangout, uh, this Google Meet that we're having, um, is a really good flat non-hierarchical way of talking about things because instead of arranging seats so that you have the chair, the uh, members, the observers, the um, intruders, uh, everybody just have uh, the same amount of square uh, in this uh, mode of like people just looking into a mirror together. And, and that is also a great um, flattener, uh, so to speak. Uh, and so I think uh, we can approach it from the very large scale by working on global problems and also working on the smaller scale by working on cooperatives and collectives. Thank you, Audrey. And Richard has a question. Richard, you can say it, and, and Audrey can also read it. Um. Uh, hey Audrey, so thank you for this uh, really fascinating talk. I mean, it, it is just uh, incredible, and I'm so glad that I got to hear you speak. 
Um, so you've uh, shared a lot of success stories, and I think we have in the U.S. have a lot to learn. Uh, I mean, we are, as Mary pointed out, we are really struggling over here. Uh, I'm wondering if you can also share, like, what are the challenges of running this very open form of government? What are some of your failures, and what are uh, what about cybersecurity and privacy concerns? Because in the digital transformation space, those are those are mm -hmm. very concerns. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, so uh, first of all, yeah, the Taiwan Can Help That Us uh, website can also be read as Taiwan Can Help That US. Uh, so, <laughs> so feel free to, to check out the, the Taiwan motto at Taiwan Can Help That US. Um, anyway, uh, and, and, and the fun thing here is that um, this is not even built by the Taiwan government. This is literally built by like 20,000 people crowdfunding uh, a certain New York Times advertisement uh, that that talks about, you know, who can help, how and can help. Uh, and it's just that our foreign service, after looking at this website, decided that we can't do anything as creative as this one. So this just became our foreign service, uh, that the go-to website. But we have no control over this this website. Uh, right. So, so and, and this shows. Um, radical trust right uh, we, we trust the citizens to to um, make essentially our diplomatic corp uh, talking points uh, and uh, give zero to come up with those innovative structures and so if it's social sector led then the privacy concerns are always uh, more easily ameliorated because the social sector are a bunch of people that can join and leave at any given time because there's no inherent uh, black boxes in the large amount of hierarchies because it's flat. Um, it's much easier for people to see that this doesn't collect any undue uh, data, that this works uh, precisely only with masks, uh, and um, mask can't claim for privacy, uh, and that if you're dedicating a mask, you can choose to attach your name on it, but even if you do, it just collects the date, but not the time, and your uncollected mask quota. And so this is l very limited information, probably cannot be used to provide you uh, in, a, in a meaningful way, um, and so on. So when it's a citizen initiative when we're just doing reverse procurement privacy concerns are um, not that large but i will not pretend that there is no privacy concerns in taiwan if you're uh, returning to taiwan um, you have to go through 14 days of quarantine nowadays we uh, shorten it to five if you come from a particularly safe place like new zealand but uh, in general it's 14 days now you can choose to go to a quarantine hotel uh, that's how we ensure our uh, uh, luxury international hotels to operate during the pandemic. Just <laughs> repurpose them into quarantine hotels. You can go to this very luxurious hotel. Uh, and then we pay you a stipend, actually, it's 33 uh, US dollars every day to thank you for your work. But if you break the quarantine, then it's 1,000 times that uh, as a fine. So you can support 1,000 more people quarantining, I guess. But in any case, <laughs> people do the rational thing and they, they don't break out of the 14 day quarantine. So, of course, it's a limitation on the freedom of movement for all the returning visitors, but it's applied in a very fair fashion, and people understand the science behind it. So there's some grumbling, but not a lot of grumbling. Um, and some people prefer not to stay at a hotel. They prefer to stay at home. They say, oh, I don't live with any vulnerable uh, group of people. I have my own bathroom and things like that. And maybe they are right. Uh, it's better for their mental health if they stay the 14 days in their own home. Um, but then how do we make sure that they, they're not breaking out of the quarantine? In the hotel, we can do this physically by controlling the elevator. But uh, in your own home, the elevator um, is, is, is yours. So I said, so how do we know? Um, and so we came with this idea of the digital fence. Basically, we give you a phone, or if you have a phone, you register it to us. And then we make sure that the telephone um, signals measured by the nearby telecom towers, uh, which they are already collecting anyway, um, is triangulated so that if you break out of the uh, triangulation perimeter around 50 meters at most, it's not GPS, it's not an app that you install, um, then there's an automated SMS sent from your uh, cell phone provider to the local police station, uh, who will then ensure that you're not breaking away, checking where your whereabouts. This applies also if your phone runs out of battery. So this is basically uh, gambling um, on the fact that people are addicted to their phones, now, which is pretty good. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll bet on that. 
nuts. So anyway, so so people are addicted to their phones, and and so um and and of course there's random uh, calls and chatbots to ensure that you're feeling well, and if you're not, then there's a lot of like counseling help and things like that, and we also pay your stipends. But of course that raises privacy concerns, right? This is essentially um tracking your whereabouts, even with a bad resolution like 15 meter, we don't know which room you're in. It is a privacy infringement. It's a deep, narrow, um, defined uh, privacy infringement. And so our constitutional courts right after SARS said that anything that's better than a lockdown of the entire hospital should be pursued. And because we never declare an emergency situation, um, so this was legal and we operate within the constitutional limits. But still, there's people who are very much wary about this. Uh, and though, so they're like, you know, um, um, what, uh, what if people track me after the 14-day quarantine? Will I be, be labeled uh, as someone who's infected? Will I be dissociated from my community, uh, become a pariah, or, or things like that? And so the CCC live press conference and 1922 play a very large part in this, in, in calming people's doubts and to uh, adamantly refuse to publish the travel histories of confirmed cases. Uh, and so that people will feel comfortable in reporting their symptoms and so on. So there's a lot of res um, resistance uh, in the CECC about this uh, demand from the public to publish the travel history as South Korea used to do. Uh, but we end up not doing that. And I would argue that pre protects people's feelings much more. Uh, and so I, I, of course, want to thank the um, like 9% of people at one point who say that they're not comfortable with the digital fence, even though 91% of people said they're comfortable because that's that's what the liberal democracy are, right? They keep us accountable. We have to provide the explanations to the MPs and to the general public. And based on the polls, we know that once we publish the, the whole white paper of how this works, um, only 6% of people disagree with that then, but we still think those 6% of people. And so there's a lot of privacy concerns, that's for sure, but it's built upon a culture where white hat hackers, um, the cybersecurity experts, just voluntarily uh, uh, penetrate the system and tell us how they did it, uh, and that they can do purple teaming. Uh, that is to say, teach the blue team, the defense team, how they think, because they think like artists, very creative. Uh, and we ensure that there's five to 7% of our ICT budget that constantly goes to cybersecurity to foster this kind of culture, so that if you're a white hat uh, hacker, a security researcher in Taiwan, you get paid very well, you meet with the president and minister all the time, uh, we celebrate your uh, like second place in the international DEFCON CTF, uh, lost only to the US team, maybe we win this year. Uh, wait, there's no <laughs> this year, but next year, like Tokyo Olympics. Uh, and anyway, so so the point here is that uh, people are paid well, treated well as cybersecurity researchers working for the uh, light side, so they don't uh, fall to the dark side, which always have more cookies. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey. Does anyone else have a question? It will be the final question because I want to be very respectful of Audrey's time. She's got a world to save, so uh, we, we need to be, yeah. <laughs> but we do too. So uh, any questions, any thoughts? Because otherwise I'm, I've got one more question and I'm just dying to ask it, but I won't. Anybody? Okay. I don't see another question. Does anybody see a question? So Audrey, here's the question. Um, how about ha how about black hat hackers? How 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 do you secure this beautiful and brilliant idea from the menace that is the other side of human beings? If we're fully dimensional in every regard, and um, you, you know there are a lot of people who would like access to data for all the wrong reasons. Are there any issues in terms of that? Yeah, definitely. Uh, and so um, I can answer it from, from two sides, the, the citizen side and the institutional side. Um, the citizen side, nowadays, because of the pandemic, uh, people understand how important it is to wash your hands with soap. Uh, and soap being the most important chemical technology um, plays a larger role than any digital technology. Uh, and so as so much so that we say you wear a mask to remind yourself to use soap. Um, and so um, this is important as in the cybersecurity, right? Uh, choose a strong password. Don't only rely on password, use multiple factors, um, um, encrypt, um, the 
end-to-end -end encrypt the connections, uh, use trustworthy uh, web devices, um, and uh, try not to download and install any web conferencing software. Instead, rely on the browser, as we're doing now. Um, and, and these are just layers and layers of protections. Each may be cutting the attack vector only by a little bit. But if you do all of it, as Taiwan did, uh, then uh, the um, social engineer uh, black hat hackers have a much harder time because people just have better habits. So, the, so that's the, the first thing. And uh, of course, it's important to just ingrain that in the education in the K-12 curriculum as well. Um, and on the institutional side, um, uh, the answer is actually quite simple. Just don't store private information, period. Uh, so, so um, for example, when we're, we're currently uh, in firmly in post-pandemic, so there's a huge amount of um, stimulus packages uh, now being designed and being claimed. Uh, for example, um, the triple stimulus voucher uh, says that if you spent 3,000 NT dollars um, anywhere uh, in Taiwan, but you have to go outdoor to do that, no uh, Uber Eats, <clears throat> but uh, uh, anything that you go outdoor and, and, and spend, uh, if you spend $3,000, then after a week, you can uh, withdraw uh, 2000 of that back from a nearby friendly automated teller machine. Uh, and so um, it, it's, it's an interesting design of the stimulus coupon and package, uh, and people enrolled on that a lot. But we made sure that when the participating banks, the ATMs, the machines, and the registration and so on, do so in a decentralized manner, you don't have to go to the centralized website to register. Rather, you go to various different banks. Um, these different banks, and you, they don't share your credit card um, purchasing history. We don't know which goods you, you purchased. Even your national ID numbers are not shared between the ATMs uh, on one side uh, and your uh, debit card uh, bank on the other. Uh, rather, uh, we use a one-time hash. Uh, we, we get a sort, which is a random number, uh, and then we add it uh, to the ID number and we only share those one-time use tokens and we throw away those um, afterwards. So um, based on the principle of secure multi-party computation uh, on zero knowledge uh, range proofs and other proofs, um, fully homomorphic encryption, on um, federated learning, uh, on differential privacy, these are just like the building blocks of uh, how we can determine uh, the uh, statistics together without any uh, party sharing any raw data or even keeping any raw data. So at rest, uh, these data are not useful, even if the black hat hacker gets into the data storage. And if you design your information systems with such uh, privacy enhancing technologies uh, in mind, then uh, the black hacks, <clears throat> there's only so much they can do. Um, and so, um, yeah, we, we learned a lot from Ethereum, uh, from Bitcoin and other decentralized communities with robustness principle very important. Uh, and if you can take over Ethereum uh, through black hat hacking, someone would have already done that because it's very lucrative. Uh, but the fact that it has stood the test of time, uh, right? It, it's battle tested, said that there's something to be said about using the right cryptographic uh, premises uh, to build your information system. So the PETs, even the most expensive one, like full uh, homomorphic encryption, are becoming more accessible. And we make sure that people, researchers, but also practitioners, have easy access uh, to the National uh, Center of High-Speed Computation Cloud, uh, the NCHC Cloud, which is a top 20 supercomputer in the world, top 10 if you count inner energy efficiency, um, and uh, that they can uh, make such calculations to protect the anonymity uh, and privacy uh, as a norm uh, when building new systems. Thank you so much, Audrey. And it's fitting that we I think we're going to close with Momo because really we began with Momo, who I called and said, is there any chance in the world that you know this person? And she said, yes, I do. So Momo actually, our alumni was the alumna was the person who actually made it possible for Audrey to come to us. So sure, Momo, you get the last words, please. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Audrey and Mary. You two are definitely like my very like important um, people in my life to change me, to form me to who I am today. So I just want to share a couple of things I haven't seen from other leaders, particularly from the government side, from, but I did see on Audrey. Because uh, big day, uh, before I, I, I went to Pratt, I was an entrepreneur uh, in Taiwan. I have the great chance to work with Audrey as a representative from the um, 
um, found a nonprofit organization. So, um, and you can see what she did is like, uh, whenever you work with her, you feel, you felt like you're being heard. That's something I also get from Mary as well. That's the, one of the key leadership I just learned from both of you. And on top of that is not just being heard. Uh, actually, she made the progress, even though it's just, it could be slow sometimes. It, it's not easy to make everything because there are so many things to do. But at least she kept like it transparent. You will see a like progress bar um, from the Taiwan Can Help kind of a uh, website. Um, so you can um, just have feedback and like track uh, on it. And secondly, they give you, the government then give you choices. Not many government will do that for you. Most of the time you give orders, administration order, either lockdown or not, it's just an order. You can see among uh, America, different states have their orders, whether it's, it's like people, you are not being considered. You're like, you just follow a rule for what the, the government says. But here, what do you see from RG, even though the mask, the maps, the, all those API, government provide resources and information and keep it as transparent as it could be. Then you make the call as a person, you make the decision on your own, then you take fully responsibility on top of it, which being said, so you can choose whether mask or not, but if you do it, here's your benefit, here's the fine you get. It's not just like, we just follow what Trump say. We just follow what government um, um, and promo say. It's all about, this is what you can do, you cannot do. If you do this, here's the consequences you have to take on your own. So you made a call, you take that responsibility. I think that's one of the best thing. As a human being, You, it's, it's so easy to make that call, right? Just like the where's the benefit of like wearing masks it's not about i vote for trump or not it's about your healthy uh, considerations so this is something i feel and i see is very valuable and i haven't seen in many a uh, government especially for those like old like nations like um developed countries it's just i don't know sometimes even it's democracy but it's really hard to to have that kind of feeling. And secondly, it's about, so I would call it the first, this is the design by heart. Like I, I feel he's the human being, the, hu, the, the, the um, um, what is the, the human who he just said um, earlier. And secondly, I will call it like the design by heart. Or does not have the one has the empathy uh, to feel about people, to be considerable. It's more than that. She's completely like incredibly um, intelligent in many ways because she studied a lot and she joined a lot of communities. Like in 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 um, academic world like us, it's easy. It's quite easy. We just have to call with many different kind of leaderships from different um, sectors. But it's really hard for the government. Um, And, and the like senators or the leaders to have that kind of things. There are a lot of under table in the negotiation West. You can see all of them join a lot of nonprofit organization. She's quite active among these organizations. And what's great about it is like, we can follow her. She shared what she studied, the book she studied recently. By the way, the radical marks awesome i highly recommend all of you it's about the next generation the design and uh, sometimes you can join about zero as well and join some of the hacks and you might see audrey there that's the way i see her mostly like outside of the government but she took that and and and, and kind of implemented into our government side so i think that's the the, the another thing i see she's not just designed by her, but also designed by her. That's something I will see, particularly in this kind of um, period of time. For the future leaderships, it's definitely, I just keep it on my notes. I just validate it again today that these two things, I will definitely uh, to recommend you and like share with you.
that's my thought. And thank you again, Audrey and Mary. Thank you. Um, yeah. I'm not even going to attempt to do better than Momo because that's very artfully said and very true. You have direct experience of working with Audrey. And so the only thing I will add, Audrey, is you won't escape because we're just going to keep coming back for more. Audrey, I'm sorry. We'll go through Momo. We'll be respectful of your time. Thank you to ST for all the help, but we're not going to let you go. Yeah, I'll be back. Thank and you. Until the next time, uh, live long and prosper. Thank you. May the forces, all of them, be with you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you, Momo. Thank you, Momo.